context, I brought, it's, it's not, don't worry, it's not, it's not disgusting. Huh? <laughs> it's just, just plastic. It's, it's, it's a brain, okay? I brought a brain. So we can, dis if, ne if needed, we can discuss a little bit about brain science. It's super cool because you open it, yeah? See it from inside. It's quite cool, yeah. Okay, so as, ah, you take a picture of me. Like, like that, that, that guy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so maybe I will, I will do the same as Anna. I think this is the best location, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so we, I have in total three lectures. Today I will introduce some aspects that I think are important for me to discuss uh, neuronal cultures in detail. And I have basically to provide an overview of, of things that already were visited by Christina, Anna, and Jesus. So first of all, I will also introduce myself a little bit. I, I work in Barcelona, um, in the city of Barcelona, actually. And I did my PhD in statistical physics, and then did a postdoc in, in Germany in experimental biophysics. And actually there, I studied how um, multicellular organisms started to develop and form a foot-tail axis. That is, a, that is a very important step. Then I did experimental neuroscience for about four years in Israel, and that was very important because there I developed new experimental techniques uh, to understand how neurons connect to one another. And then um, there I learned all the techniques that are necessary to build neurons in, in, my, in my laboratory. And then in 2008, I came back to Barcelona as Ramonica Hall researcher, and I established my own laboratory, at the actually at the Faculty of Physics of the University of Barcelona. So I'm a physicist, and I have a neuroscience lab in physics. And this is the people that presently is working, or that, 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 that presently is working, or that left recently. So yeah, so Asana Cristina is, is happy because there are a lot of female, female scientists, correct? Yeah, that, that's good. And actually, I, same thing as, um, as other teams, that my, my, my team is quite, quite international. I have mathemat mathematicians, computer scientists, and even people in robotics. So you will see something about robotics on Wednesday. So yeah, and this is quite natural nowadays to have a very varied team at work. So um, first of all, I will, I will start linking my work with Jesus one, okay? Uh, where is Jesus? Oh, not yet, okay. <laughs> but so Jesus explained a little bit Kuramoto, and this is a, a quick summary of Jesus' talk, okay? Remember that the interesting thing is that you have this critical coupling strength among the, uh, the oscillators. So here, basically, you have a synchronous phase, and here, uh, sy synchronization builds up very quickly. And actually, the thing is that Kuramoto, Kuramoto oscillators are not neurons, okay? This is something that is very important. However, if you average enough neurons, you get Kuramoto oscillators. And this is an example. Actually, um, in case you want, I brought my code here, so you can play, you can play around with uh, numerical simulations. Uh, in the code I, pr I have with me with, on, on MATLAB, I have um, a numerical model that is very uh, simplified <laughs> as compared to the Hodgkin Huxley. I will explain why a super simplified model is super useful. I will explain that tomorrow. But the point is that you can play with this model. And then you, you see you, you can uh, simulate the behavior of easily 100 neurons or more as, as a function of time. And know that if I average of these 100 neurons, you see I get something that oscillates. And it is because uh, this neuronal system as a, as a network system, okay, uh, it, it exhibits collective behavior. And in this case, the collective behavior is in the form of quasi-synchronous. Uh, uh, let's say, patterns of neurons, okay? So when you average together, you have the same kind of oscillations, and actually you can take that as a Kuramoto, as an effective Kuramoto, Kuramoto system, okay? And the idea is not bad, actually, if you take, that's why I brought my friend here, if you take uh, the regions from, from, from the brain, the, the brain is highly modular, so you have to imagine that each of the different regions of the brain is processing locally a particular function, okay? So for instance, here, the, the red one, this is the, 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 the motor cortex. This is each, each part, each small region here is uh, controlling a particular muscle of my body, okay? So if I look at that area with easily one million neurons, 
and I study their, their behavior, they often, I can often simplify the system by averaging out what is it doing, okay? Uh, of course, it's doing some computation, but if I don't really care much about the computation, I can, on average, describe the behavior of, of a particular region of the brain with an oscillator, okay? Then I can couple them together and study, let's say, uh, let's say the average of the average, <laughs> let's say, okay? And it's, it's interesting because you can really do something that, some things that are um, productive and powerful. So, for instance, in the context of, um, of, of, uh, of Kuramoto oscillators and the brain, so people actually is using Kuramoto models to try to understand how the human brain wave develop, okay, and, and why they are so different and why they are changing when we close the eyes and other aspects. But in particular, people got fascinated in using these Kuramoto oscillators to try to predict the behavior of brains that, that, that suffer Parkinson. Yeah? So Parkinson is associated with a malfunctional beta wave that over-synchronizes the network, okay? Just simplifying a lot, okay? So here, here I put actually an example that it, this is the, the normal beta, beta wave, this kind of oscillations, and, and if we think in the context of Jesus' lecture, so we have, this is the, the, the critical coupling, our brain in normal operation, our brain is oscillating in this region all the time. The reason is that I have to process information locally, I have to, in, to integrate, for instance, the information from my eyes, from my hearing, from my touch, I have to process that information first locally and then integrate it together, okay, to make sense of, of, of my environment, yeah? So basically I'm oscillating here, there, here, there. But in Parkinson, the, 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 um, the problems, the death of neurons in particular regions makes the system over synchronous, okay? So it's basically here, yeah? So people is using Kuramoto models to try to understand what's wrong, what's wrong with the communication between different brain areas that the system as, as a whole, okay, the system reaches such a state of synchrony, yeah? So this is very interesting, but of course, ah, oh, it's a pity, Jesus is not here. Oh, anyway, <laughs> but as a, as a, as a somehow criticism, criticism to myself, these models are very dangerous are, and very difficult and are actually very phenomenological, okay? Because of course, a PD, Parkinson's disease is strongly tied to problems at a cellular and molecular level, okay? So to average out everything, it's dangerous, yeah? We can discuss that, we will discuss that later. But the point is that you can, phenomenolo phenomenologically, okay, you can use Kuramoto oscillators to uh, help predicting the behavior of some diseases, okay? So just for finish this part, here is an example of a, of a person that is, su that is uh, suffering Parkinson, yeah? So th it's the, the same person, the idea is that to treat Parkinson, not to cure it, but to treat people that, that, that has Parkinson, uh, a way is to, to, uh, to correct for this defective beta wave, okay? So what people is doing is to place electrodes inside the brain, yeah? And then you, you tune, you, you, pro, you uh, stimulate the brain, okay, with some frequencies, and those frequencies, what they do is to correct for this malfunctioning beta wave, yeah? And people is doing that theoretically using Kuramoto oscillators and also in the, in the clinics by tuning with which frequency, okay, which strength of the frequency that you stimulate the brain is sufficient to correct for this beta wave, okay? Anyway, the point is that all these ideas were basically to explain that Kuramoto is useful, but warning, warning, neurons are not oscillators, yeah? This is what Anna told us before. So I have to go back. If I, if I want to do something that is, um, let's say, interesting at, the, at a neuronal level, I have to forget Kuramoto, unless I want to average a large population, okay? That, that, that has to be clear for everybody. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So, um, so then, um, I'm, I'm experimental, as I said, and I work at different scales. I work at what, what, what we call the microscopic scale, in which we look in, in detail on how neurons connect to one another, shaping very small circuits, I say, of one or two neurons. Then I work at, at the mesoscale, in which I consider 100, 1,000 neurons on that order, and I look at the circuits that, that they shape together, and then I, I ask myself, how are the neurons coupled together, able to exhibit collective behavior such as the uh, oscillations that I provided before, okay? And this is my favorite scale. This is super, super cool, because Anna, Christina introduced us that there are complex networks, they are fascinating, you can make very different networks, so I have a nonlinear system with noise, with a complex network, and I can investigate how different patterns 
of collective activity can emerge okay, from, the, uh, from, from, from these three elements. And then, of course, we can also explore the microscopic scale in which, as I said, I can average different circuits and see how they interact to one another. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, it's in this context that I, I love working with neuronal cultures, in which it's a beautiful, complex system, and I can play a lot with it, okay? But there, there are some, of course, there are some, let's say, ethical requirements, okay? But it's, you're gonna, you, you have to imagine that if you like neuroscience, you have the, the possibility to take neurons, play them on a glass covered sleep, and manipulate them somehow. It's super beautiful. And this is the idea of, this, of the, the talks that I will present uh, these days. Yeah. Okay, so let me review very quickly the basics of a neuron and a neuronal culture. We have this uh, video here. This video is illustrating in, in some sort of numerical simulation how the arrival of a stimulus in the, in the, in the dendrites and the soma triggers an action potential, which is this flash that you, you see propagating down towards the axon. So conceptually, neurons receive inputs on the, um, through, the, through the dendrite or the soma. These, these inputs are integrated here in the core of the neuron, and when a threshold is reached, a pulse or action potential is generated that travels down the axon up to the terminals which connect to the next dendrite over there. Okay? Conceptually, this is what we have, this is what Anna explained, summarized very quickly. And yeah, but of course, neurons are not alone, so I can imagine something like this. And I, pu I put this just um, intentionally to explain two important concepts. One is that you, are, you have a, a train of pulses that are reaching this neuron, for instance, but in different synapses. Here, another one. And also, something very, very important, and is the noise. That accidentally, and maybe for you surprising, but ac accidentally, the neurons fire. Just because they have to, uh, they communicate to one another using uh, chemical neurotransmitters. And accidentally, the neurons are releasing quite, uh, qu qu quite frequently neurotransmitters that, that conceptually for, the, for a neuron are just random spikes arriving to it. Yeah? So this is very important. These systems are extremely noisy, understood as random spikes everywhere. Um, and this is, conceptually, this is very important because, as, as, as I said before, you have, sorry, there, there is a delay between my finger and the, <laughs> and the slide. Anyway, because, as, as I said before, um, um, uh, actually, discussing with Anna, the hodgkin huxley model is the, is the best that we have, yeah? But you, have, you can simplify a lot and get, go into a very, very simple model called Izikevich. It's the one I will use these days. And the beautiful thing is that this Izikevich model, when you plug in it into a network, a complex network with properties, some interesting properties, together with noise, actually the detail of the hodgkin huxley is not so super important anymore, yeah? The collective behavior is more important. And this is something I want to translate to you these days, yeah. Okay, anyway, so this is a summary again of the action potential. You get a stimulus, which can be excitatory, which increase the, uh, the membrane potential, or inhibitory that may make it down, okay? okay? And then you have to reach some, so, some threshold above which the system fires, elicits an action potential, and go, goes back to the resting state. And as I said before, so this is the, the intrinsic dynamics of the, of, of the system. Noise, which is accidental release of, of neurotransmitters, and the complex network, which in general have both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Excitatory tend to pass the signal and strengthen the, the, the propagation of information, and inhibitory ones tend to stop it. Okay? And the balance between the two, like a traffic light, is what actually makes uh, information meaningful. In, I mean, you, that you can, process, you can process information that makes sense. Yeah? Okay, so far clear, more or less? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, of course, let me, you can interrupt me whenever you want, okay? And then, as, Anna Chris, uh, Anna Christian, as Christine introduced, we have also um, complex networks. Here I put two cases that are particularly beautiful and that I invite you to play around. One is what we call a random graph, in which neurons more or less connect randomly to one another. However, with an interesting property, that is uh, distance, okay? And the reason for that and is that both the brain and most the brain and most of the neural systems we work with are embedded in a two-dimensional two, two space. Yeah, that that is one reason. A second, a second reason is that wiring wiring for a biological system is super expensive. You have to keep the wiring healthy. Yeah, so this means that uh, you will avoid that unless it's necessary. So basically, neurons will tend, in general, 
first to connect with a, with a neighborhood and establish long-range connections only if the function requires that. Okay? So this is, this is important, and this is called random geometric graph, in which neurons, neurons connect randomly, but in, in a neighborhood, typically. Okay, so this is one graph that is very beautiful to, 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 to play with. Please let me know that if you want to do some simulations these days, let me know. I, uh, I will help you on that. And also, this graph is also nice because it also uh, portrays something fascinating of neuronal circuits and its modularity. Modularity meaning that groups of neurons tend to connect much more, much strongly within the group than with uh, neurons in other groups. Okay, so here you can see the yellow, the red, the blues, all those constitute modules co or communities yeah, of neurons highly uh, connected to, to, to one another. And actually, it is beautiful because uh, both for me as experimentalist and for many other people modeling brain circuits, people found fundamental to capture this property in a, in a, in a, in a living neuronal system. And the reason is that it's the same. The reason is that I'm all the time obsessed trying to capture in vitro something that behaves like that. Um, why? Because I need, if I manage to do that, I can help people with diseases, or I can provide tools to understand complex networks f starting from scratch. There are many, very, there are many motivations as clinician, clinician or as a physicist to try to reproduce as best as possible in vitro something like a brain. Yeah. Anyway, so. Um, with this, with this at hand, um, this is a summary <laughs> in one slide of all things I do in my laboratory. Uh, sorry for the Zoom. <laughs> well, anyway, I will share these slides, but here is a review I wrote recently where I explain all the possibilities that you can do with, uh, with neural cultures, basically from understanding if or, or, what, or with which mechanisms neural cultures manage to activate spontaneously without any help from the outside, what happens if I kill one neuron with a laser? How can I simulate in the computer neural networks that, that, that look like and resemble the behavior of neural cultures? How important is the network in defining the collective behavior? What happens if I try to neuroengineer? If, what happens if I try to, to mimic as best as possible a, a real brain? Is that possible or it's something, something super crazy? And finally, can I help as a physicist and with humility, okay? Can I help somehow to uh, help uh, medical, the medical community to treat very bad diseases with, uh, with my neurons? These are basically my, my questions, yeah. And, and yes, finally, we talk about neuronal cultures. And basically, <laughs> neuronal cultures are something very simple. I put them, I didn't want them to get, no, I don't have living neurons. No, no, don't worry. But, <laughs> but I have, oops, I have. I, have, I brought my toys from the lab, so you can see. But basically, what I, wanted, what I want to show you, show you here is that, well, you can, you can see it. But here, <laughs> no, I cannot, I cannot do that. <laughs> okay, but here you have four cavities, okay? And each cavity, you can put around 10,000 neurons. Okay, so please go, take a look quickly. Yeah, so in, this of the, in each of these cavities, you can put neurons, and neurons, you will see very quickly where, where do I get them from, but conceptually, I kill rats, or I buy rats that are dead, okay, and I take the neurons before the tissue de deteriorates, and then if I'm fast enough, I can put about, yeah, 5,000 neurons here, this is about three millimeters in diameter, and yeah, they're there, they sit down, they anchor to the surface, and then they start again to put, project connections and dendrites again. Yeah, so basically, in just tw tw 24 hours, they're able to reconnect and make another network. Things, things so simple as that, okay? The problem is that, of course, you completely destroyed the original, let's say, diagram, the original network of the system. So this means that, uh, of course, this circuit that emerges here is not able to produce the computation it was designed for, okay? So it basically connects in a totally random way, yeah? Uh, but but, but the, the super cool thing is that, sorry, one moment. <laughs> the super cool thing. Oh, this delay is a bit. Now, okay. The, the, the super cool thing is that I put my, uh, my neurons, they grow, and in just typically four days, you see they have a spontaneous activity, okay? They are fighting without any assistance from the outside. And this is an example, and this is how quickly they are 
connecting to one another. You can see, sorry that I don't know what happened with the, anyway. But you, you see that they are projecting connections, okay? And the network is formed very, very quickly in just three, four days, very, very quickly. And so basically, you can, you can get a very, a very, very nice and, wor and working uh, living network you know, in your laboratory with very few, let's say, efforts. Yeah. And let me just compare for you to, to make it clear. This is the dynamics of the mouse cortex. So I can take, uh, in this case, a mouse. I can put a camera inside the brain record activity, this is spontaneous activity, and you see I have a rich repertoire of, of, of activity patterns, but for the culture, the activity pattern, the activity is very, very poor, and this reflects what I was telling you before, that uh, the, the connectivity diagram among neurons has, has totally been destroyed during the process of cultivating the cells. Note, note that the neurons, the neurons that, are, that are here and the neurons that are there are the same conceptually, but the wiring between the neurons has been totally changed, okay? This is designed by experience and to, to perform a particular function, and this is totally random, yeah? Questions so far? Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, gracias. Um, is there a constant frequency that arises naturally from, from the if I guess, sorry? from this natural um, circuitry, spontaneous activity? Is ah, there a frequency that... If, if, if I can add the, the frequency of oscillations here. Yeah, like alpha uh, ah, oscillations. Ah, okay. The, the frequency... Yeah, yeah. The frequency is changing. You mean if the, if the frequency is maintained or keeps changing? If there's a constant frequency, you know, that arises uh, spontaneously from the... Oh, yeah, yeah, network. this is spontaneous activity. Yeah, but there's a uh, one specific frequency no. or like no... Well, it keeps changing. It keeps the problem, changing. The problem is that... Oh, this is, is, is a good question. Because uh, in general, living neuronal systems like this one, they have something called homeostatic plasticity. Homeostatic plasticity means that they want to survive, <laughs> they want to be active, but minimizing the, ener the energy. So what they do is to uh, find a balance between the, uh, these firings that basically help neurons to know that others are, are there, yeah? and with, also with minimal and, and energetic cost. So basically, when neurons are developing, they fire a lot. So the, the, the frequency is very high, because they, re they need communication with other neurons. As soon as the network is fully formed, and basically everybody connects to everybody and talks to all the others, then the system relaxes a little bit, reaches some kind of a steady state. So it keeps changing, which, is, which can be a, some kind of a nightmare, which things I will explain tomorrow. <laughs> okay? Okay, good, very good. So we have this in mind. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the, net, the, the neurons reconnect at random but yeah. do you mean that literally is it a random network or is it like... Yeah, they reconnect to one another, but in, in, a, in a random way. But it, it, in terms of network uh, geometry, is it a random network or more like a scale-free network or something ah, like that? Okay, it's a, it's a good question. In this case, in this case we think it's a, it's a random network. And if you want to make it a scale-free or other kind of network, then you have to go touch on into neuroengineering. <laughs> okay, then you have to force the neurons to connect in a way that you like. Okay, to, try to force a different architecture. That is one thing. Another option is that you give inputs to the network. The, the, one of the problems is that here, in reality, my, 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 my mouse before, well, my mouse, <laughs> before dying, I was, I was going to say, my, my, my happy mouse, uh, this mouse is receiving inputs, inputs from sen sensory inputs from everywhere. The problem of the neural cultures, they, they do not have any kind of inputs. So basically, neurons connect to one another just to survive. But, but if I had input in the system simulating motor action or something, or, or whatever, okay, or eyes, whatever, then neurons will slowly reconnect yeah, to par carry out a particular task. Okay? This, this is the point. Yeah? And because it's not that, 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 that is not there, the system is some kind of in a, in a traumatic state in which it, it wants just to survive. But I, want, I will go to this point later on these days. Yeah? Anyway, so we have two basic cell sources. 
One is the rat, rat pr pr primary cultures, uh, in which we take parts of the brain, we dissociate the neurons, and we play the neurons on a glass covered sleep. And another, another one is what is called human-induced pluripotent stem cells. This is a technology that is relatively recent, about 15 years, or what was created about 15 years ago. Uh, conceptually, what you do is that you can take cells from the skin, typically, okay? Then you can make those cells pluripotent by using um, transcription factors, and then once they are pluripotent, you can differentiate them in w whatever you like. In our case, uh, neurons. So basically, this is extremely powerful. First, because you don't use animals anymore. That is very important. At least in Europe, we, uh, the European Commission wants us to stop using animals. That is one reason. But what is more interesting is that you can plate neurons here that come from people that has a particular disease. In my case, for instance, I work with Parkinson, Huntington, and other diseases. So basically, that is super powerful because you can compare a, a healthy culture with one that, that has one of these genetic diseases. And this, and this is super cool because then if you manage to understand what's, what's wrong okay, with the disease network and you find cures for that disease network in vitro, maybe then you can translate that to, to, to medicine. Okay? So this is very, very, very powerful, this idea. And yes, and, and now once we have that, this... Uh, the, the, the selection for a particular, let's say, preparation, then you can make the typical homogeneous culture, or then you can do a lot of real fun, that at least for, for me, for physicists, this is where I enjoy, that I can create circuits, weird circuits, and try to force neurons to connect in a particular way, so slowly and hopefully with efforts, okay, I tend towards circuits that are meaningful in the context of, of the actual brain. Yeah. And also, if, if, if you want to make things more complicated, we can also plate neurons in what is called hydrogels, so we can approach three-dimensional-like structure. Yeah. So basically, most of our efforts in the lab are go, go in, in that direction. Yeah. These, so we have interesting, in, interesting questions. One is, can we build biological networks with dynamics that is closer to the brain? Well, yes, more or less, we can. Uh, are they resilient to damage? I will tell you tomorrow, no, no spoilers, okay? So a few, a few questions here, and these questions I will address them next days, okay? Yeah? <laughs> and yeah, so we have this thing, but the important thing is, okay, that I have, I have my system. My system is alive, yes. Quest it's only a curiosity. Do you use uh, organotopic culture? It's not, sorry. Organotopic. Uh, organotypic slices. I could, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, yeah. I could, organotypic slices, she's referring to uh, if to take a brain, right, a brain, and then make thin slices of that, make thin slices of that brain. So then in those thin slices, you, you, you keep the original connectivity of the, of, the, of the animal, okay? So in principle, you could record activity and explore the behavior um, in a condition in which the connectivity has been preserved, okay? It's true, we could do that. I don't do it because other colleagues in the area of Barcelona are working on that. So I got specialized in neuronal cultures uh, because I like the concept of neuroengineering, but it's true. Your approach is totally valid. And we realized, for instance, that the activity patterns when you explore a thin slice of the brain is very, very different from the one that, that you have in the culture. Yeah, more questions? No? Okay. So how data is obtained? So that is something important. So in, in my lab, we have two, two things right now. Oh, yeah, I have two things. One is, so it's here. It's this thing. <laughs> OK, we have two different toys. One is the, actually, this stuff is very expensive. <laughs> but it got infected with a fungi that we cannot get rid of it. No, it's not there anymore, okay, in principle. But you, you, it, it's, it's safe, okay? It's safe to, to touch it. But basically, conceptually, what, what you can see here is that you have a chip in the, in the center. I will pass it around now. But you have a chip, and this chip is like a CCD, like a CMOS chip from a, from a, from a good camera, okay? And we plate neurons there. And you can put about around 10,000 neurons in there. And then what we do is, is to record this, the electrical signal that you get from those neurons directly. Yeah? So very quickly, I will pass it through everybody. So conceptually, we have these super fancy chips. We grow the neurons there. And of course, as soon as you have 
an, an, electric, an electrical signal, okay, as the source of communication between the neurons. As soon as you have that, you can de directly detect that um, that current, current or voltage in your system, okay. So you you take that stuff, okay. You take that chip, you put that chip inside that machine. The, the chip is is there, and then you record activity. That is a, an option. Another option that is more that to me is more interesting. I will explain you why. Another option is to use to use just imaging. Uh, in the wells that, that, that you saw before on a glass, okay, I just put a camera there with a with a with a technology called calcium fluorescence imaging. I will explain to you in, in a moment, and then you can visualize with a microscope the activity of a, of the neurons indirectly because I'm using a marker that de that detects an ion <laughs> that is ex that is incorporated into the neurons when the neuron is firing. So blah, 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 blah different steps, but I can get uh, a measure of, of activity. Which one is better? It depends. It depends on, on what you want to do. What's a, what, what I love from this system, that I can record directly electrical activity, and if I want, I can stimulate the system. Yeah, Because this is a bidirectional. So I ca if I want to, I can make a, a, a system that I can simulate the arrival of sensory input to my network. So I can more or less design a system that behaves like a super tiny brain in my laboratory. I like that. However, one of the problems here is that I cannot see exactly where the neurons are. And if I try to put obstacles in the surface of the chip to simulate complex paths okay, to imitate the brain, I often damage the chip. Yeah? So bad luck. <laughs> that, that's life. Okay? So <laughs> that's why, in general, in my lab, we like a lot this technology in which we put the, the neurons here. I can put a lot of traps and different configurations to, for the neurons to connect in different ways, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And this is, for me, a lot of fun compared to that one. Yeah? But, I, I, but I play with, with both of them. And actually, you will see a super cool application of this machine towards the end of the course. OK, good. And So this is an, an example of the activity I get in my el electrodes. So each of these dots correspond to one area uh, of about a few micrometers across of and that, typ that typically contains one neuron. Typically contains one neuron, but is not true. Sometimes the signal that you have here is mixed up with other neurons in the. I sorry, sorry. Excuse me. Just sorry, sorry. Just, <laughs> just, just hear one, you. Sorry. Small, di small detail. Each pixel. How many? How many neurons, more or less, do you cover? Yeah. This is. A, this is. A, it's true. Yeah. This is. <laughs> this is a problem. This is a problem of the system that because it's a, it's, a, it's a chip, I cannot see where neurons are. And statistically, I have to play a lot. I have to play neurons with different densities to more or less statistically yeah, have one neuron per electrode. This, is, this would be the ideal, but you have to do a lot of tests. However, there is another problem, and is that one of these signals here, or that one, okay, is getting uh, electrical signal from the electrode and for the nearby ones. So then you have to do very crazy triangulation processes to know who had fired. That's why it can be a nightmare, OK? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, OK. But uh, it's very nice. So uh, basically, this is a summary in case you have the slides. But it's, it's the same concept, OK? That you have the system here, you have the electrodes, and you place the neurons in those electrodes. And sometimes you see uh, one neuron, normally, this, ideally, that, that, that would be the, the, the situation in which each soma is on an electrode. But of course, life is complicated, and this not necessarily happen. Okay? Anyway, but this is a summary. This is a kind of chip. I will skip this thing. Yeah, and then the, the second technology is uh, something called green fluorescence protein. Actually, someone, this was fun, because someone Walking around, no, walking around, no, a, 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 a biologist that wanted to understand how jellyfish <laughs> were communicating, were com communicating, and were using strategies to hunt. Uh, so th this biologist realized or discovered that these jellyfish were using green fluorescence proteins. And these proteins become fluorescent in the presence of, of calcium. So basically, they, they fold, they are not fluorescent, they capture calcium, and when they capture calcium, they fold, and they become fluorescent. Okay, so these people developed, this, discovered this technology in 1962, and since, since then it became a big revolution to indirectly visualize activity 
in, in neurons, and this is my favorite technique in, in, in the laboratory. It's super cool for the following reason. This is an example of how it works, okay? I have to, of course, stimulate with a, with a, with a light that raises the level of the electrons, okay? And then in the, in when, when they relax to the, to the basal state, they, they emit light in a, in a different wavelength. So normally I stimulate in blue and I record activity in green, yeah? But conceptually, something that, that I like very much is that I can use viruses that encode for this fluorescence protein. So this means that I can culture my neurons at day zero when they have not formed a network yet. And then every, every few hours, I can record activity or visualize what's going on in my network so I can see how activity builds up as, as the network is slowly being formed, okay? And that, for a physicist, is super, super cool, yeah? Because if I manage somehow to get a configuration of my network, I'm able to relate the dynamics that is emerging, yeah, with the network that I have in my system. So for, for me, it's a super dream, and it's very, very nice. And so, so we can follow development, and this, this is conceptually the idea that I have to choose a wavelength for a stimulation, uh, another wavelength for emission. I have to play to make it as sharp as possible, yeah, which is sometimes very difficult. So I, I'm, I'm putting this thing for you to realize that things in the lab are difficult, <laughs> okay? No, there is no magic, okay? Okay, good. So, so this is an example of the different kind of cultures that we can record in my lab, but sorry, we will see them tomorrow, okay? Uh, but just for you to see that this is a very beautiful modular network, for instance. This is a modular network with, but with more modules self-organized. And this is the one where I put stripes okay, to direct the connectivity in particular directions. But tomorrow you will see this kind of data. What I want basically to, uh, to discuss in the few minutes that I have left, I will skip this, in the few minutes that I have left is that this, this kind of technologies can be developed towards extreme cases. And for instance, pe pe people develop what is called um, light shield microscopy, in which conceptually you have two lenses mount mounted like that. Yeah? So one lens is oscillating like this, for instance, to capture the light, and the other one is oscillating like that to emit the light. So basically, what, if, you, if you synchronize them perfectly, when one lens is moving, one lens is moving to stimulate, and the other one is moving to capture the light. So basically, conceptually, you can record activity in volumes. Yeah? And this is very cool for an animal called uh, zebrafish that I put the video here. This is a, a, if you don't know that, this is an important concept for you to remember, and is that uh, nowadays we have the, the technology in the laboratories in the world to record activity, volumetric activity, of full animals. In this case, this, this is called zebrafish. Zebrafish is a, is a fish, <laughs> okay, that is famous because when it is in the very early embryonic stages, it's totally transparent, to, 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 totally transparent, okay? So basically, you can record up to 100,000 100, cells simultaneously, the entire body, the, the, the entire brain in this case, uh, in real time, and during the evolution of the animal. And of course, you can put predators in front of the, of the zebrafish or other things, so you can see how neurons fire in response to particular stimuli. So uh, remember that there is technology nowadays to access full brains, in this case, of the, of the zebrafish. And this is the kind of data I have in my, in, my, in my laboratory. So I have these beautiful tracks over here in which I try to induce uh, activity in a particular direction, in this case, like that. And basically, uh, the typical way that data is analyzed with custom imaging is that I have my neurons firing over there. Then for each of these flashes, I associate a region of interest as a, a, as a neuron, and then I extract the traces for each of the neurons, so, something like this. And if I want, I can convert these jumps that I have here into zeros and ones like that. Okay, this is conceptually the way I can get the data. Of course, things are very difficult, and I think that you, Christina, you will talk tomorrow, right, about time series analysis, right? <laughs> so uh, Christina also knows how dangerous and difficult is that. And let, let me put you an example. When neurons fire, actually, uh, neurons are able to... The, 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 the typical time scales is that a neuron can fire typically every five milliseconds, more or less. So a neuron can fire like this, like this, like that, maybe like this, something like this. Okay, this is a short train of spikes. Uh, so electrically, I can get this data very accurately. But if I convert this to my calcium imaging technique, what happens? Calcium imaging means that 
when this happens, calcium goes into the cell, binds the, the fluorescence protein, and activates the mechanisms for me to see the fluorescence. So this means that I have a delay, and basically I have to wait, this goes up. The signal goes up, goes down, like this. This, is, this would be my equivalent yeah, calcium signal for, for, for my system. If my, temp, if my temp resolution is bad because I cannot afford a super camera, what I have is something like this. Yeah, so you see, I cannot see, I cannot see completely the dynamical patterns of my, of my neurons. And that's very frustrating. So this means that, unfortunately, even if I have more or less a decent camera, you see here I have sharp peaks, but I'm totally unable to know exactly the, uh, the, the activity uh, patterns of, of my neurons. And that's dangerous, because if I cannot resolve exactly the spike trains of my system, this means that I may interpret data in a wrong way. Yeah? So, so what do I do? Do I analyze data using calcium imaging, or I try to infer somehow the spikes, even I know that I can make a lot of errors? This is dangerous, and one has to discuss that. Yeah? And that's why, <laughs> that's why I put this thing here like a Western movie, is because there is a fight between the multi-electrodes people and the calcium people. Multi-electrodes, you can get super beautiful time resolution of your events, uh, but you don't see where the neurons are, and you can, you can get multiple events around the region of interest. Yeah? And calcium, because you can know exactly who fired, but uh-oh, yeah, I know, but mm, maybe my activity is masked somehow. Yeah? And so please, first lesson, be aware that when you play the data, you have to think about it carefully. Okay? Okay. So, and here's an example. Okay? Uh, in my lab with my students, we develop different techniques to try to infer the, uh, the, uh, the uh, spike trains that we have. These are the spike trains that we have within the calcium trace. We work very hard on that. And actually, uh, it's interesting because if you talk to the person that sold you the virus, the virus encoding for the fluorescence probe, you can get information about the biophysics of that probe. So you can make a program that, that tries to mimic the biophysical behavior of that probe, right? And this is what we try to do here. But you see, so this is apparently the reconstruction that my computer tells me is the best one based on my knowledge of the fluorescence probe. But you see, uh, the computer makes mistakes sometimes. You see? Sometimes it gives me errors down there. Yeah, that doesn't know sometimes what to do with such a small amplitude. You see, I get signal over there. So it's dangerous. And <laughs> so what do you do? What do you do? What, what can you do? Sometimes you do well. You see, I don't care. <laughs> I just want to see if neurons had fired or not at least once, like here. And then I put a line, I put a threshold, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm happy with that. Yeah? You, you can do that. But then you have to be aware that you are removing some data that may be of interest. And I'm telling you that all these things, because when you play with the data, if you have to play with the data, be aware that for each step in the processing of the data uh, has or can convey artifacts. So that, 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 that's why I put here the excla exclamation mark that I have here, my raster plot with the fluorescence traces, uh, sorry, my, my, my fluorescence traces on top. From that, I detect these uh, jumps and I ascribe them as a spikes in my raster plot, which is here. Then I can play with this data and try to see the, the network of communication between the neurons. And in each step, I'm often making a lot of assumptions. Yeah. So, we, so be careful with that. Okay. And I will skip this. Just um, I will stop soon because I want maybe we have some discussion. But uh, to conclude this part, there is a, techni a technique that is uh, emerging now that is very powerful, and it's optogenetics. Optogenetics allows me to um, to trigger normally the activation of a neuron. I can also I can also trigger the silencing of that neuron. But normally it's used to activate a neuron with light. Conceptually, for a neuron, let's say a standard neuron to fire, it receives, for instance, neurotransmitters, and there are um, ion channels that are sensible to that, to that neurotransmitter, and that opens the ion channel and, and activates the mechanisms okay, that make the neuron fire. Okay? That's why Anna was showing the sodium channels that were very important for the activation of the neuron in the Hunch King Huxley model, but there are other channels, in this case, those ones, the ch ch channel rhodopsin, that open with light. So basically what I do is to infect neurons with this, with this channel rhodopsin, 
um, that uh, that is expressed in in the in, in the membrane, and then I just shine the neuron with light, and I force the neuron to fire. And why is that useful? Well, because I can interrogate the circuit. I can stimulate a neuron one by one in my network and see which others reply. You follow? So conceptually, in principle, I could reconstruct the map of connectivity among the neurons. This is one thing. Another thing is for playing around with that super thing object that is the C elegance. How many, how many of you know the C elegance? Ah, you know, okay. Okay, but the, okay, the, the, the C elegance is a, is, a, is a small worm that has 302 neurons and about, if I'm not mistaken, 2,280 connections, if I'm not mistaken, okay? But the point is that we know everything about this animal. Everything, I mean, we know all the, the connectome. We know how neurons connect to one another. And why is so fascinating? Because I can use optogenetics to stimulate one by one and see what happens, <laughs> okay? It takes a lot of work. But conceptually, what I can do is to relate the structure, the layout of connections and neurons that I have there, and the function of that particular neuron or a small circuit. Yeah? And this is an example, and I will stop here, an example in which first I show you that to develop this technology, people, what people did was to put an enrodopsin and, and in addition to, uh, to label the, the neurons with the first sense protein, that in principle you should see the neurons firing maybe here. So I think that, yeah, okay. So you see the animal is moving, and you can you can uh, let's say mark each of each of the neurons and see what happens in real time. Okay, so this is one thing. But the, the super beautiful thing is the, this stuff. W what I do here, or what scientists are doing here, is basically uh, study this freely moving worm, and when they do, uh, when this arrive here, what the scientists do is to trigger a signal to a neuron in the head that that neuron thinks that someone is touching the tail of the worm. Yeah? So the, the something, something happens. The, the animal think, thinks that there is a predator or something chasing, chase, ch chasing it, so it, it turns around to try to see what's going on over there. Yeah? So this is super powerful because you can interrogate the circuit in the sense that you can understand which is the function which is, okay, which, is, which, which is the function of each particular neuron or groups of neurons. And this is so powerful that, uh, that, that you can really cheat the animal in many different aspects. For instance, um, uh, this, can, this worm, the C. elegans, hates high levels of O2. Our levels of O2, 21%, are, are horrible for the animal. I mean, the animal doesn't like them. The, the reason is that this animal feeds of, uh, of uh, food, of food, no, sorry, food or, or animals, vegetation that is decaying. So basically you have a lot of CO2 from, from bacteria, right? So the animal, as soon as the levels of, CO, of, CO, of O2 are too high, the animal just moves around, normally goes down in the, into the soil to reach for uh, locations where the O2 is around 7%, something like that. So what experimentalists did was to uh, stimulate the, the circuit, the neurons using autogenetic, stimulate the neurons that control the O2 levels, okay? And you see, even, even if the, even this is for, for red, is the 21% oxygen, so it's okay, you activate the neurons, the animal moves and so on, but even for 7% of oxygen, which is the one in blue, in which the animal is happy, you are really forcing the animal to move. The animal doesn't want to move, has no need to move, but you are activating the circuits that, that forces, that force the animal to do it, yeah? So this, in, this indicates how strong is this concept of stimulating with optogenetics, yeah, the neurons to do something in particular, yeah. And I stop here in case we want to discuss something, and tomorrow we give more details on cultures, okay? Yeah, okay, so thank you. Yes, we have time for discussion because we started a little bit late, so we have 10, 15 ah, minutes okay. for discussion. <laughs> yeah. It's not that I want to ask a question, but I think you have a question on the chat because someone was trying to ask a question from oh, the, from the from screen. The Zoom. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Ah, yeah, there is a chat. Ah, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the thank you, thank you, wonderful yeah. talk. Yeah, you have can to. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. 
So in a few slides back, you saw a time series like very complicated inverse problem. So I didn't get it. I, I, I didn't get your actually. Can, can you type it in your in, in in the chat maybe? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Is because the acoustics? Okay. Actually, you showed a yeah, time series in very complicated inverse problem. So a few slides <laughs> back. Yes, your, your, your question is about data. Ah, here. Very complicated inverse problem. So you showed a, a time series like a occasional very rare large. So you were asking about data analysis, right? No, no, no. Actually, you said you are fixing some threshold and we are collecting the data above the threshold. So in what way you are fixing the threshold? That, ah, for, for the threshold, when I put, you mean, when I put... Just I. Yeah, I think once... You I mean, when, when put, I, yeah. this, this thing, you mean, when I put here ah. a threshold? Yes, 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 yeah, exactly. So, so how you are fixed here, this threshold and... And one more question, how long you can uh, collect this time data for, is it possible to collect the data very long time, more? Is it possible to? Long time. Long time. Is it possible? Yeah, well, very maybe, long time. Maybe, you, maybe you, 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 you're going to send me an email and I can reply, maybe. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Ah, sorry. Ah, wait, 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 wait. How long is it possible to collect data? Ah, sorry, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. How long? Actually, that's a good idea. That, that's a good question. Normally, uh, normally we record activity for about one hour. Sometimes for one for one hour, and that's and the reason for that is that we're going to get a lot of statistics for the behavior of the of, of the system of the system, and the problem is that if you record for one hour, at typically 100 images per second, to get a good resolution of your uh, activity, you collect typically half tera per experiment. But yeah, but typically we record for one hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, thank you, Hilda. Yes. Yeah, the, my my question is about this class in question. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, I want to know. I I didn't get when when you were giving the talk. What are the pointers on the top? Oh, I sure. Mean, how do you get them? Yeah, <laughs> the point on the top. The point on the top are. The, the spikes that should be those, okay? So, so ideally, that those are the spike trains, and this is the calcium. So what happens here is that I use, with red, I use, I use a, a code, okay, a, a mathematical code that tries to predict the behavior of my fluorescence probe and tells me which are the most probable spike trains that I mark over there as circles. That is the concept, yeah? Okay, thank you. How long does the cell culture usually live? Again, sorry. How long does the cell culture usually live in the culture? Ah, ah, a good question. Yeah, the, the the cell actually in this in the chip in the chip they can survive about four months, four or five months. In in the calcium imaging, they survive for about three three four weeks, and the reason is that to to attach the neurons to the surface, you have to use proteins. Yeah. But the pr and the neurons really attach to the surface. But neurons keep evolving all the time. And they evolve so much that sometimes they themselves, by accident, degrade the, the substrate. So basically, at the end, they detach and die. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is also about the cell culture. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have other types of cells other than neurons? Because we know oh, in the brain we have neurons and astrocytes. Exactly. Yeah, it's true. I wanted to. I wanted to mention it, but I wanted to, to simplify, so it's true. We have neurons and astrocytes. That's correct. And normally they grow, they, they grow in parallel. So actually that's complicated because sometimes astrocytes, they sometimes they dominate the population of, the, of your system and they can really overflow <laughs> completely the culture. So we have to use different chemicals to control the population of astrocytes, but they are super, super important. I think Anna mentioned them this morning, that they, they, they are not excitable cells, but they play a very important role in regulating the activity and helping the activity of, of the neurons. And for instance, tomorrow I will explain, I will talk to them a little bit 
because in one of our disease projects that we have, we know that the astrocytes are dying. The astrocytes die, they cannot take care of the neurons, so that causes the neural network to, de to, to degrade indirectly. And that is the origin of the disease. Yeah. And tomorrow we will, be, we will discuss that. Yeah. So in the beginning of the presentation, you show a hazard plot with several fire neurons and a local of field potential. Uh, I would like at the to beginning, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I would uh, like uh, to know the, that they were forming connections very quickly, no? Yeah. And how do you get the local field potential from the hazard plot of uh, the, this, the fire these videos? Spike in neuron? How do I get those videos? No, 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 no. In the beginning of the presentation, we talk about the Kuramoto model. And then you show a picture of several fire neurons producing wave, waves. And then there's a picture which there, there is a local field potential. Ah, yeah. I, I think it's the third slide. Yeah, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Here, no? Yes. Yes. How do you get the local field potential in the bottom pattern from the upper from simulation? Here, from here to here. How, yes. How do I go there? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, okay. S uh, yeah, okay. So I simply sum up vertically this, ah, this raster sorry. plot. It's a simple, uh, uh, yeah, summing up or average right. of the activity in your system. Yeah, all right. it's just like that. All right. yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I want to know what is the difference between having like 10,000 neurons or I don't know, maybe more or less. So wh what's the effect of having more neurons for different, for example, for uh, resistance state fluctuations or maybe in the, graph in the, properties? In the context of neuronal cultures? Yeah, in the context of neuronal cultures. Uh, oh, oh, because neuronal cultures completely lack sensory input. Uh, the density doesn't really mm, affect much the behavior of the system. So you always get this kind of synchronous behavior, yeah? But if I want, if I want to design my system to engineer my network to resemble dynamically a, a brain, let's say with neuroengineering that we will talk tomorrow, then I have to be very careful with tuning the, connect the, the connectivity and the density. Otherwise, if I have too many neurons, then I will very quickly get to this regime of high synchronization. So I have to tune the system so I allow the connectivity to be sufficiently strong for information to flow, but sufficiently weak to allow for rich computation. Yeah. If, if, if everybody connects with, with everybody, I get nothing. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. OK, so uh, but why 10,000 neurons? Uh, that's because of the? Oh, 10,000 neurons. Ah, 10,000 neurons. Oh, I was, it was an order of magnitude. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, but 10,000 neurons, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, but uh, typically in these glass covered slips, I, we played between 100 and 5,000, something like that. It depends on the experience. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, it depends. It's because it depends on many things, but <laughs> I mean, th there are experiments in which you only want the neurons to survive for some reason, so you don't really care about the, about the density, but when you want to engineer something that approaches a real architecture, then you really want, you have to be extremely careful. It's something that I didn't mention much, but but maybe you we'll, we'll also talk about excitation and inhibition, I don't know. But, okay, but there are excitatory and inhibitory neurons, so you also have to balance them a little bit. So that it's, it's the balance between the two that allow the system to compute information, yeah? Otherwise, it gets to totally wild, yeah? But for, for the same reason, you have to tune a lot the density as well. It's a bit messy. You, you need experience, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, the data that you use it is open source. Or this the open data. Source. It's available. It's available. For the community. It's open. Ah, ah, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. Sure, sorry. Thank you. Yes. Um, particularly, I mean, this code. We have few codes. Let me look for it. We have we have data with calcium imaging. We have data with multi electrode arrays. We also have data that analyzes the, the system. Um, is there, is there? Th this one, sorry. This code is called, Net oh, sorry, it's called NetCal. 
this one. This code is totally free. Yeah, you can you can download it, and we are updating it. So it's it's a software that is designed to help people to analyze videos of calcium imaging and get the data, and it's, it's totally free, and, and you and you can play with it. Yeah, but if you cannot find it, you can ask for us. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's thanks Jordi again. <laughs>